Hi guys, Olive here. Here today with my first reading wrap up video in an entire year. Today I will be talking about all the books that I read in December 2021. Let's see if I remember how to do this. <laughs> Even with the busyness of the holidays in December, I still managed to have a pretty decent reading month. I read a handful of books I really enjoyed. I had a couple of very unexpected but very fulfilling rereads, and there was only one big disappointment, but we'll get to that. Let's start off by discussing the couple of books that I read in an attempt to recreate the spooky season for myself. The first one of those was Half-Lives, The Unlikely History of Radium by Lucy Jane Santos. This book is about the world's most radioactive, naturally occurring substance. We start off with the story of how radium was discovered, but then very quickly we move into what the rest of this book focuses on, which is a history of the commercial uses of radium. All the information in this book is incredibly interesting, and I would say it's skillfully presented. She talks a lot about how radium was promoted as this wonder substance, liquid sunshine, they would call it. It could do everything from restore the pigment in your hair to make your watch glow in the dark. But as we know now, it has devastating effects on the human body. What I liked most about this book is that the author doesn't judge people in the past for having the wrong idea about radium. Of course, reading all this now as a modern reader is horrifying because we know how dangerous radium is, but they didn't have that information at the time. And she really successfully puts you in the shoes of someone who just didn't know any better. And she also really skillfully communicates the sense of optimism that there was surrounding radium at the time. But given this book's subtitle, I was expecting it to be much more of a science book than it ended up being. I found it to be much more of a cultural history of radium, the history of what we've understood about radium, the history of how we've used radium, what we know now, so kind of that progression over time. So it wasn't exactly what I was expecting. It was good, but it also wasn't really what I was looking for. And then I read a spooky YA book called When All the Girls Are Sleeping by Emily Arsenault. This book is set at a girls boarding school, and our main character is a student named Haley, and she is investigating what may have made her her former best friend take her own life in the year prior to the events of this book. Rumor has it that her ex-best friend may have been being haunted by a legendary school ghost that haunts one specific dorm every winter. Haley has to do a lot of sleuthing in this book as she's investigating this ghost. And I think my favorite part about this book is that it felt like very realistic snooping. Like it felt like something a teenager would actually do. She she does a lot of getting phone numbers out of people for seemingly innocent reasons. She infiltrates a Facebook group at one point. She goes digging in the library's archives in order to find out more about this ghost. Like it felt like what a resourceful teenager would do if they were looking for answers. I just kept wondering, how does she have time to do all of that and still attend her classes? Like for a campus novel, there's very little schooling actually going on. But that was really the only thing I didn't like about this book. I liked everything else. I thought it was really spooky, appropriately so. I thought the ending was really satisfying, just a really good YA read. And it was actually good that I didn't get to this one in October like I originally planned, because these hauntings happen during the winter months. This book is set during the winter. So reading it when it was cold outside actually made it a lot more of an immersive experience. So yeah, I really liked this one. Thank you so much to the author for sending a copy my way. I don't have that copy anymore because I included it in one of my niece's Christmas presents. I felt like she would really enjoy it. So thank you so much for the copy. I may not have it, but it's staying in the family. And then I finally finished A Most Remarkable Creature, The Hidden Life and Epic Journey of the World's Smartest Birds of Prey by Jonathan Myberg. I had started this one earlier in 2021. I put it down for unknown reasons. And 
And now I'm kicking myself that I left this one unread for most of 2021 because this was fantastic. This was a five star book for me. This is a book about the striated Caracara, also known as the Johnny Rook. They are extremely smart, extremely mischievous birds of prey that live on the Falkland Islands, which is a collection of islands off the coast of Argentina. And even though this book is about those birds, it is very much a work of natural history. There is so much else going on in this book because the author's central question is basically, how did these birds get this way? And he is willing to go in depth and way back in history in order to answer that question. This is a very difficult book to describe. It's just kind of an experience. It's a little bit similar to Ages for Hawk by Helen MacDonald in the way that this author, who also happens to be the lead singer of the band Shearwater, which is the name of a different kind of bird, and Anyway, he discusses this author and naturalist named William Henry Hudson, and it was kind of similar to how Helen MacDonald put the spotlight on T.H. White, the author T.H. White, in Ages for Hawk. But then again, this book is a lot less personal than Ages for Hawk. It's much more of a natural history. Again, it's very difficult to describe because of all the different elements, but the combination works. Another combination that just works is A Peculiar Combination by Ashley Weaver. This is the first book in Ashley Weaver's new cozy mystery series, which is set during World War II. And the main character of this book, and I'm assuming all the future books in the series, is a woman by the name of Electra, or Ellie, as they call her. And she belongs to a family of petty criminals. They break into very low profile places, they pick some locks, they steal valuables, and then they go on about their day. But their latest job was actually a setup. The British government needs their help in picking a lock. And so they set up this job and then they catch them stealing. And when they're apprehended, they give them the choice. Do you want to help with this thing we need your help with? Or do you want to face the law? And obviously they decide they're going to help the British war effort. I buddy read this one with the wonderful Kate Howe, and we both ended up really enjoying this one. I thought the case was incredibly interesting. There was a very thought provoking moral dilemma at the core of the case. And I can tell you that I don't know how I would have behaved if I were in the shoes of one character who is very closely connected to the case. So it's definitely good food for thought. And it's also just a lot of fun. This is the first book in the series. So we're learning a lot about these characters. There's, of course, Electra, who is a firecracker. She is so much fun to read about. But then there are members of her family, like her uncle and her two cousins, who are both away at war. And then there are two different love interests for Electra. And it's a really intriguing love triangle because both of these men really have something to offer her. Both Kate and I have read Ashley Weaver's previous series, the Amory Ames books. So I was talking to her about this observation that I had that I felt like Ashley Weaver definitely wrote this one intending for it to be a series. I think the Amory Ames books could be read as standalones. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you do, but I think they could be read as standalones because each book has such an open and shut kind of mystery case. Whereas this book, I can tell that while each book is going to probably have its own mystery, I think there's going to be one central story that pulls you through all the mysteries, one through line, connecting all the books in a way that the Amory Ames mysteries didn't have. So I feel like Ashley Weaver is branching out with this series that way. But I'm along for the ride. I thought this was fantastic. I thought it was great fun. She has so so much skill in writing mystery books. So a really solid start to the new series. And then to celebrate the holiday season, I had this whole themed experience surrounding the Nutcracker for a period of time in December. First and foremost, I read the story The Nutcracker and the Mouse King by E.T.A. Hoffman. I had surprisingly never read it before. And then I went to go see a performance of the ballet The Nutcracker for the very first time. I had never seen a performance of The Nutcracker. After that, I read a book about the ballet called Nutcracker Nation by Jennifer Fisher. And then to top off the whole experience, I read a new retelling of The Nutcracker that is influenced by both the story and the play called Midnight in Everwood by M.A. Kuzniar. So my feelings on all four of these things. 
Well, the story, it was way stranger than I thought it was going to be. Knowing that it's mainly read to children, I wasn't expecting it to be so dark and so twisted. It was interesting. It was just very different than I thought it was going to be. And then the ballet. Ooh, okay. The ballet is beautiful and the music is stunning. It is iconic for the Christmas season. But I kept waiting for there to be even a tiny hint of story in the second act. And it never happened. I was so confused. I kept thinking I missed something. So I looked up things after going to see the ballet and I realized, no, the second act just doesn't have any story, which was rather disappointing, to be honest with you. I'm not sorry I saw it because it is so iconic and I'm definitely able to understand its appeal a little bit better and understand why people love it so much after reading Nutcracker Nation. That was definitely a very informative book. But other than that, I found Nutcracker Nation to be rather middling. Like it was fine. I probably would have liked it more had I liked the ballet more. Honestly, the thing I liked most out of these four was Midnight in Everwood, the Nutcracker retelling. It's a fantasy book. I saw it's being marketed as an adult fantasy book when that's not the case. I would definitely call this a YA fantasy book, which isn't to say anything negative about it. It's just clearly a YA fantasy book. Our main character is a young woman from a wealthy family. Her name is Marietta. She loves ballet dancing, but her family wants her to give that up and marry. But when she rejects one suitor who is clearly not of this world, there is something very strange about him. He banishes her to a magical world called Everwood, and she has to find a way to escape. This is a very beautiful book. It's very decadently written. She definitely does overdo it sometimes, but I didn't mind that. It reminded me a lot of the works of Rosamond Hodge, who wrote Cruel Beauty and Crimson Bound. I think if you like her books, you will enjoy this one. But if you don't like her books, you definitely will not. So after my whole Nutcracker experience in December, I don't know that I would now refer to myself as a fangirl of the Nutcracker. I definitely wouldn't go that far, but I am absolutely glad that I experienced all four of these. Now, before I discuss the rest of the December books, I did very quickly want to mention the one written book review of mine that went live during December. For the Christian Science Monitor, I reviewed There She Was, The Secret History of Miss America by Amy R. Jetsinger. This is a history of the pageant from the 70s up through the modern day. There was actually a previous book that covered the history from the 20s through the 70s. So this one picks up mainly where that one left off. It's a very interesting book. It'll make you see the pageant in a whole different light, largely because this author is herself a really big fan of the Miss America pageant. But at the same time, she is very honest about it. So if you'd like to learn more about that, about this book, I will link my review in the description box below. And then as I said at the start of this video, I reread two books during the month of December, both rather unexpectedly, kind of on a whim. The first one I reread was Bridget Jones's Diary by Helen and fielding. I reread this one because I wanted a little bit of a pick me up and I hadn't reread it in a long time. But every time I do reread it, I always do so during the holidays because I really associate this book with the holidays. And this book was as funny and charming as I remember. It never fails to lift my spirits. But I was slightly amused and mildly horrified to realize that I'm now the same age that Bridget Jones is during this first book, and I just couldn't help but hope that I am not the type of person who she would refer to as a smug married. I also reread The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde because I wanted to hop in on this virtual book club that I discovered very last minute, and that's unlike me because I like things to be planned. But in retrospect, I am so glad that I just picked this one up and reread it because we went on to have a fascinating discussion in that book club meeting. We talked about the three main characters and whether or not we thought they may have been different aspects of Oscar Wilde's personality that he was kind of challenging and thinking about by writing them in this novel. We talked about whether or not Dorian Gray had addiction problems and whether or not that influenced his actions later on in the novel. I had a great time in that discussion. I've had a great time thinking about all those things 
since. I definitely don't think that this is a perfect novel. I think it's actually a little bit too long. I think it rambles on a little bit, which is surprising because it's already a very short novel. But if you like classics and you haven't read this one yet, it is absolutely worth a read. And then toward the end of the month, I dove into some novels with varying degrees of success. But the first one I had a lot of success with. I loved it. It was called A Town Called Solace by Mary Lawson. And in this book, we follow three characters in a sleepy northern Ontario town. The first character is a little girl whose older sister has gone missing. The second character is that little girl's neighbor, an elderly woman who is not currently at her home. She's away at the hospital being looked after because she has some health problems going on. And then the third character is a younger man who comes to stay at that elderly woman's house. This is definitely not a flashy book. It's very simple when it comes to its writing, but it's complex in very sneaky ways. The way that Mary Lawson makes the lives of these characters overlap and intertwine, the way that she plays with the timeline, it's just very smart. And even though the subject matter can be very sad, it's a very comforting reading experience in a way that I just absolutely loved. It felt like a weighted blanket of a book and it was exactly what I needed. Next up was The Memoirs of Stockholm Sven by Nathaniel Ian Miller. This book follows a very restless man who initially goes to work in a mine, he then gets injured, and then he goes on to lead a very different kind of life in the Arctic. It would be an understatement to say that I was loving this book in the first half. In the first half of this book, I thought I had found a new fiction favorite for the year. I thought it was going to earn a spot on that list. I loved the writing. I loved the story. I loved the characters. I was completely lost in this book. And then the second half happened and things just got progressively weaker. As more and more characters started entering the mix, I felt like the focus on the story was lost. Everything that was good about the book in the first half, I felt like we lost most of that in the second half. All the language that I was loving in the first half got way too big for its britches in the second half. I don't understand why all these modern authors feel they need to write a retelling of Silas Marner. So the first half, I would say is a five star book and the second half is a one or two star book. So I ended up averaging it out to be a three star read, which broke my heart a little bit, to be honest with you. I really felt that this was going to be a new favorite. And in the first half, it definitely was. So I only recommend this book for that first half. The second half, I don't think is worth your time. But if you're into audiobooks and you want to give it a try, I do recommend the audiobook. I got a complimentary copy through Libro FM for reviewing purposes. Thank you, Libro FM. The narrator is fantastic, but the second half of the book really let me down. But no other book this month was as big of a disappointment as Agatha of Little Neon by Claire Lucchetti. In this book, we follow four Catholic sisters who are forced to leave their current living situation and move into a halfway house because of the church's financial woes. And we follow one sister more closely than the other three. Her name is Agatha. And it's very clear she doesn't want to be a sister, probably never wanted to be one. She just didn't know what else to do with her life. There's not much more I can say about this book because there's not much more to say about this book. It is essentially complete plotless. It just wants to be quirky for the sake of being quirky. I have no idea what the point of this book was. I said this next thing in my Goodreads review, but I don't know how else to say this. It read like a Coen Brothers movie, but with all of the entertainment value sucked out of it. I kept pushing through this book. I didn't want to admit defeat. I was hoping it was going to get better, but I was very close to the end when I just had to cry uncle. I could not take one more second, so I DNF'd it. After those two disappointments, I really wanted to cheer myself up, and so I picked up this next book a little bit ahead of schedule. I originally wanted to read this book on New Year's Eve, but I ended up reading it a little bit earlier than that. That book is called Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk by Kathleen Rooney. 
This book takes place on New Year's Eve, hence why I wanted to read it on New Year's Eve, as several of you suggested that I do. But this book follows Lillian Boxfish. She's a woman in her 80s, and we are in the 1980s as she's taking a stroll around New York City on New Year's Eve. She's observing the city. She's thinking about how much has changed. She's also reflecting back on her own life and how much has changed throughout her life. She was once the highest paid woman advertising executive, but over time, she came to be seen much more as a relic. So much about who Lillian Boxfish is has changed over the years, but the core of who she is as a person is very much the same, and it's very much with her as she takes this stroll around New York City, dealing with all the quirks of the city, remembering things about parts of the city, seeing how it's better than it was before, but also how it's worse. She's also making a lot of friends as she's out taking this walk. It's a really charming book. I can definitely understand what everyone sees in it. I had a lot of people cheering this book on as I was doing my big fiction unhauling project last year. A lot of people wanted me to keep this around. A lot of people wanted me to read this. And I can see why I did very much enjoy reading it. I can't say it's the most memorable thing I've ever read, and I can't really see myself rereading it, but I'm definitely glad that I experienced it, even if I did read it a few days before I originally intended. But the two books I actually closed out the year with were two nonfiction books by Joan Didion. I am sure you've heard the news that we unfortunately lost Joan Didion very recently. And I never like to be the person who only picks up an author's works after sad news like that. But I did have The Year of Magical Thinking on my shelves, and it seemed like the right time to read it. The Year of Magical Thinking is Joan Didion's memoir about losing her husband very suddenly when her daughter was actually in a coma in the hospital. And then after I finished The Year of Magical Thinking, I read the follow-up book, which is called Blue Nights, which is another memoir, but this one is about the loss of Joan Didion's daughter after her daughter had a series of health emergencies. I've seen a number of comments from people about these two books regarding how distantly they're written. Like, they're books about grief, but they are written in a rather impersonal way. And I don't disagree with that. I just didn't have the same problem with that as other people did. I think the reason why they're written that way comes from a part of the grieving process, or at least how I've experienced it, because a part of that process, at least for me, was confusion. Like it is so hard to wrap your mind around the fact that a very important person to you, or in Joan Didion's case, two people, two very, very important people in her life, it's so hard to realize that you now live in a world where those people no longer exist. It seems like she deals with that confusion by using repetition in these books. So there are a lot of repeated ideas, quotes, or memories, things that she obviously can't get out of her head. And I felt like that repetition was included because she's trying to make sense out of something that will never make sense. Grief doesn't make any sense. Loss doesn't make any sense. So if you go into these memoirs looking for a traditional outpouring of emotion that you may have experienced in other grief memoirs, then you will be disappointed by these books because it's just not how she's dealing with it in these two memoirs. I don't think there is a right way to grieve. I don't think there's a right way to write about grief. And so I definitely appreciated these two books for what they were. It was a sad end to 2021, but I don't know about you, but for me, 2021 was a doozy. So it felt like a fitting send off. So those were my thoughts on all the books that I read in the very last month of 2021. Of course, these books will be linked in the description box below for your clicking convenience. If you have any thoughts on any of these books, I would love to hear from you in the comment section below. And if you would like to keep up with what I'm reading and writing about right now, you can find me on a variety of places around the internet, including Goodreads and Instagram, where I'm the most active active. The links to all of my profiles will be at the bottom of the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.